Yeah, but uh, it did not work, so, okay. Well, when we go to the historic development of, of the actual knowledge in this field, we can uh, actually talk about what went on in the last, let me say, 100 years. So the landmark technique was established by a German physician, Kuhlenkampf, or surgeon, and he uh, tried to use anatomy landmarks, guided procedures, and he started with the first blocks in this area. Paresthesia was described by Moore in 1975 and stimulation at the first description in clinical way from green blood in 1962, but it came into clinical practice from Doug Zellander in 1975. Ultrasound is having its first reports in 1978 by Lagrange, a French group, and since 19... 89, we find in clinical studies uh, three groups. One is Singh in 1989, Friedel in 1992, Stefan Kappel in 1994. A database where we clinically use ultrasound for applying regional anesthesia. And to tell it in reality, the clinical use of ultrasound started uh, in the year 2002, where many people started to use this technique. So when we go to the next, we have to demonstrate that, of course, in this development and in this timeline, we had the landmarks, the stimulation, and the imaging. And closely with landmark was, of course, connected with paresthesia. So we had to talk about paresthesia and anesthesia. And if we talk about the stimulation, of course, we have to talk about the movement of the dector muscles. And if we go to the imaging, we talk about uh, the depiction with sonomorphology morpholo and the high resolution of a two-dimensional picture. And if you look at the real situation, dual guidance. Of course, we can put two things together. One thing is to use a needle advancement after stimulation that was already mentioned. And we, of course, can use 1 milliampere to 0.5 milliampere to find out a motor neural sensation and to apply the medication uh, at the end point. And uh, we believe that we then identify the nerve and place a regional anesthesia block. Compared to this, the situation with ultrasound is a little bit different. We place uh, the needle close to the nerve, we avoid the needle nerve contact, and we apply the medication under visual control. And we put two lines together and make uh, the calculation of it, of course. An idea could be to use dual guidance. So dual guidance would be, in the end, the identification when probably visualization is suboptimal, or to use it as identification when stimulation is suboptimal. So, okay. This is really funny here. Next, I think the battery is low. Next slide, please. So it had been about five years before from B. Brown a publication regarding, regarding dual guidance, and it was uh, produced here by Admir Hasic and uh, some other colleagues. And with this publication, as I demonstrated clearly a pathway how we should use uh, this technology. And if we go here to the point, I can show you the pathway. So the idea here is to use ultrasound to identify relevant this anatomy, to place a needle in a close endpoint. Then we set up the nerve simulator to 1 milliamp for superficial blocks, for 1.5 milliamp for deep blocks. And depending on if we have a switch or no switch, we process it the way you see it here, so you already see it's a little bit complicated. If you have an inadequate ultrasound imaging, for example, but a twitch that is present, you probably do an injection. You do not inject when the twitch is below 0.2 milliamp, and of course you should not exec uh, applicate the medication with a high pressure. On the other hand, if the needle placement is not perfect on ultrasound, and if you do not have a twitch, the injection of one up to two milliliter of local anesthesia or uh, a gluco a glucosis uh, might be possible to avoid resistance. And if you have an adequate spread, then we will have, of course, an appropriate block. So this procedure sounds a little bit complicated to me, but it's just a concept of dual guidance. And using this concept of dual guidance, um, I made a videotape 
and I hope it is running. You see the situation here. It's also not perfectly trapped, but you see here the ultrasound system on the hand. The taping is after. What you see the ultrasound pictures in the second step, and you see I'm stimulating with one milliamp, and we are reducing the signal. And if you look then at the situation, of course, you get less motor response and less reaction. And what you also see, we have a short axis approach. We see the approach to this nerve, it's a musculocutaneous nerve, and if you have the musculocutaneous nerve, you see the application. Well, the needle is relatively close, and we see the effects, but we are not perfectly sure that the needle is not coming too close to the nerve, so that's one of the biggest problems. So we have a problem in the application on one hand, and in the moment when we inject already the motor response is away. So this is one of the biggest problems in this technique. So we use, in this aspect, a technology where we apply the medication and where we probably uh, get both factors. The positive factor of using stimulation and the negative results when we, in the same time, use ultrasound imaging at one hand. So it's a little bit problematic. And if we go on further, so I hope no, it's not working. Uh, something is here wrong. The so next slide, please. So next slide, please. What can happen to you personally? It can be a really big problem. We can have a correct ultrasound picture and the stimulation is the exact end point. We are, have a stimulation and we have a correct ultrasound picture. But what also can be, we have a correct ultrasound picture and the stimulation is wrong. It can be false positive or false negative. And, of course, what can also happen, we mentioned it before, ultrasound picture can be false or the needle placement is wrong and stimulation would be correct. And on the last line, ultrasound is false and stimulation is wrong. Then it's really 200% bad. So if we go to the next point, we have to indicate what is going on. If we talk about what is possible, we have to talk what are the failure rates. So the failure rates in literature, we find false identifications of around more or less than 30%. So the needle is sometimes outside the nerve, but we have still a correct signal. So that is a problem. But what we also can see, and you already mentioned it, is the needle is inside the nerve, and we cannot stimulate the nerve. So this is also a big problem. The same with ultrasound. If we are, have a false identification with ultrasound, and to be clear, we are doing here an ultrasound conference, in certain cases, I estimate around 1 to 3% of our patients, we sometimes do a false identification, but we have to react on it. We probably are unable to get an appropriate imaging. We probably get a poor depiction. We probably have technical problems. So needle management, for example, is not perfect. We have problems with anisotropy. We have problems with the sonar anatomy and the variability. And then we have to react on the situation both procedures have components that inherit failure rates. And that is a really big problem. So we try to do the next. So we have to talk about interferences for both. Procedures have different endpoints. I mentioned it. The endpoint of ultrasound imaging is a motor neuroic stimulation. The end point of ultrasound is the application of medication around the nerve. The movement of the arm and the select probably will make a tremendous interference to depiction. And as you saw it before, handling with both is complex, but it's manageable. But handling is also time consuming. If you have two guidance systems, you have to clear up which one is 
it's relevant for you. So the management of different informations at one time have to be cleared, which is your gold standard and which is not your gold standard. On the other hand, of course, we have to talk about advantages. The years before, when we started with the ultrasound techniques, the change from stimulation to ultrasound guidance for many people was extremely difficult. And up to now, I will say only 30 to 40 percent of the anesthesiologists really use ultrasound guidance. It is in Europe not more than 60 percent of the patients uh, that are treated usually with stimulation techniques. That's the reality in the moment. And if we have to implement ultrasound techniques in our technical use, in our daily use, the use probably of both techniques might be more convenient for the beginners and it might be give them more comfort to use both techniques. In addition, what was already mentioned, double guidance might give additional information. But we have to be careful and if we take the next slide, so we have a jumping mouse. You have strictly avoid this. You see, I'm outside the nerve and you have the stimulation. This is a needle. Try to go there. You see the needle, it's outside the nerve. And the only thing you can do, you have to reduce the energy. So what we have to do, of course, we have to reduce the energy so that you do not have this interference with the depiction. So probably this rate of stimulation we had before is not sufficient when we use it with ultrasound. We are much closer to the nerves and we are much more comfortable and safer when we do our applications. And we re when we reduce the energy, we probably get better results in imaging and we probably even can recognize if we are very relatively close to the nerve. So next one. So we can come, of course, to the indications. Where do I personally see the indication of using both techniques? I see it exactly where uh, Brian finished. We can use it in deep blocks and in very deep punctures for different reasons. If you have a long distance application of the needle, probably with steep angles and a reduced visualization of the needle, the technique might be useful and it might help us to avoid any kind of complication, for example, penetration of nerves, etc. And, of course, it might be possible to improve the needle trajectory and to avoid unsafe puncture procedures and to avoid the application uh, of the needle in a wrong anatomy. And finally, we have to talk about the difficult anatomy. If you have a difficult anatomy, additional information will give us additional help. So if we come to the end point, so we have to conclude that we have to, to talk about the reduction of stimulation energy. We have to use both, probably. The stimulation effects, we have to reduce the energy. We should use the effects you talked about, the small needle movement, so we have to be very polite. What we are doing is really high precision work on the patient. And finally, we have to manage the interpretation. And what you see here is the latest catalog of a needle production company. And you see the first needle without stimulation there. So even the companies have addressed that probably the needle is not in any case it is a short needle, it is five centimeters, any more necessary for the placement of superficial blocks. But it is obviously necessary for deep blocks. Thank you very much.